Hi everyone. Uh, today I wanted to give a little bit of background for um, this week's readings on race, ethnicity, and culture. So I put together a little PowerPoint with some of the uh, topics that we'll be covering. Um, this isn't meant to be an outline of the, the readings by any means. It's just more of a discussion of the topics to look at um, how they apply in different ways. So let's see if I can share the screen here. Okay. Um, like I said, this week's readings are focused on the concept of culture uh, and, and diversity in terms of racial and ethnic categories. Um, then what I thought we would do is start off with a, there we go. Um, I just want to start off with the description of the word culture. And there are different ways to look at the actual word. For example, we can talk about culture as a broad concept, right? And that's where the book and the different readings that you've, that you've um, done take this in many different directions and try to de define um, culture or cultures largely. You can also look at the concept of culture in terms of your individual identity. So what is your culture, right? Um, and so we're gonna look at some examples of that. Um, the first set of concepts I want to look at entail looking at culture in the original way that it was meant to be looked at when um, anthropologists started going out and exploring new groups around the globe. Um, and they would go in and look at culture in terms of a uh, broader social group. And so what they um, did was look at the different systems that comprise that group. For example, um, in any given cultural group, you're gonna have a specific economic system that enables that group to uh, distribute and allot resources and manage resources in a way that keeps them um, alive and able to survive. Um, there will also be a specific kinship system, right? The way that uh, relationships develop and how people um, define those relationships and, and familial um, connections. Um, cultures also entail systems of educating um, groups um, in terms of providing them with uh, foundational knowledge to basically support the economy, right? Um, but education, broadly defined, right? So how people learn how to do specific tasks or accomplish specific um, goals within that group um, to keep it uh, alive and, and surviving. Uh, there will also be systems um, that govern, so political systems that govern the relationships and management of resources and um, you know, rules that keep order within a specific group you will also find distinct belief systems that emerge in terms of um, maybe organized orthodox religions or other beliefs in um, higher powers or beliefs in the way uh, the world um, has been created or the trying to explain how things operate. Um, and finally, the last cultural universal is uh, entails communication systems. So what type of language or languages are used, um, what forms of those languages are used, and for what um, purpose. Um, how people use technology or writing or other um, means of um, symbolic communication also in, is involved in that, that particular universal. So um, summarizing that, any culture that you go into you can look at these different universals, these different systems, and try to understand you know, how that particular group um, sustains itself and um, in terms of how it's organized to, uh, to operate on a daily basis, right? Okay, so those are different cultural universals. Um, when you look at culture as a deeper concept of meanings and patterns of, of interaction and relationships. Uh, you can look at three broad components of culture. So 
Um, the book talks about material objects that you find within a culture. Uh, these are often um, used as symbols, right, when talking about a different culture. Uh, and regardless, they those material objects are used for specific purposes, okay? You can also look at the ideas, values, attitudes of a particular culture. Um, and finally, you can look at behavior patterns. Now, these three components are interrelated. And so when you have, for example, the introduction of, of a new material object, um, let's say cell phones, for example, um, the use of cell phones or computers or um, cars or horses or, or whatever, um, whatever uh, type of object is introduced to a community, that material object then has influence over the way people interact with each other. Those interactions then develop into behaviors that are uh, predictable and um, which then result in um, shared values or attitudes around um, right or wrong, good or bad, um, what is appropriate and so forth. So you, you can look at culture in terms of those three um, particular components. Um, there, there are also um, specific principles of culture, like um, fundamental um, ideas on how culture works. Uh, and the book does a pretty good job of, of outlining those. Some of the most important here um, that I, I think are, should be focused on, um, for example, is like the notion that culture is learned. Um, so uh, culture is not innate. When we are born, we learn how to be a member of a particular culture by interacting within that sociocultural context. Um, and those behaviors that we acquire um, happen in, in a similar way that you, you acquire language. Okay, so um, there's no manual on how to be a member of a culture. You learn how to act in appropriate ways by taking part in those social interactions. Um, the next principle is culture is shared. So people uh, share a culture, meaning they have similar values because those values and attitudes and beliefs and behaviors are um, constantly negotiated on a daily basis through interactions. And um, without a shared understanding of how to operate and interact, then you wouldn't have a cohesive group um, dynamic. Um, the next one is culture varies. So even within a cultural group, you have different um, subgroups or different ways that the, those cultural um, features uh, manifest, right? So there is no monolithic um, you know, culture that, that ever changes, right? So the culture is always changing, it's dynamic, it, it depends on all sorts of different influences and interactions um, with other uh, groups. Uh, and that's the notion of cultural diffusion, uh, sharing ideas and learning and adapting. Uh, uh, and the last principle is culture affects biology. So you want to look at the way that a culture um, is developed and the way that the behaviors and, and values um, are shared, uh, then lead to specific specific impacts or effects on your physical um, you know, being. So the, the picture here is a, a mosquito and that's related to the point um, mentioned in the book about the uh, widespread um, diffusion of agriculture in, uh, in Africa uh, and after, you know, during the Neolithic turn when um, egg, we became more dependent on agriculture, we needed more land for, um, for growing crops. And so the, um, the need to cut down large uh, you know, areas of, of forest to cultivate was, um, was necessary. And that produced broad areas that uh, would collect water during rainfall. And large standing pools of water were breeding grounds for mosquitoes which then um, with the proliferation of mosquitoes, you had um, more cases of malaria 
and as a biological uh, reaction and adaptation to malaria, um, sickle cell anemia formed um, and developed in populations. And so, um, which then killed off a lot of people, but um, individuals who developed you know, not full sickle cell anemia were able to resist the um, negative effects of malaria. Anyways, you can still trace the impact of that original um, you know, uh, reaction to malaria and biological adaptation um, to widespread cases um, and tracing out uh, sickle cell anemia in um, specific African-American um, populations. So, uh, but anyways, it, it also has to do with um, maybe, you know, dependence on, you know, automotive and, and, and other machinery that produces um, exhaust and pollution, then uh, that causes our bodies to react in different ways and, and maybe widespread development of um, asthma or, um, you know, you also have the impacts of like spread of diabetes based on different dietary habits and, and things like that. So um, yeah, cultural habits that develop also have a specific impact on our biology. Um, okay, so in anthropology, we like to look at culture from in, in, in various different ways, okay? Um, we talk about those universals um, in different systems, we talk about those principles or different components, um, but uh, I think an underlying strength of anthropology is to try to understand uh, the community members within a culture from their perspective, okay? And the slide that I have up here shows um, the theme, uh, a, a similar theme, right? America, but from different angles. So uh, for the individual with the flag, you know, wrapped around their shoulders, um, gazing out over what appears to be the Statue of Liberty, you might have more of a nostalgic uh, view of America um, that entails you know, being open to immigrants and opportunity and, and those kind of things. On the, the scene on the right, uh, which is a, a scene out of South Park, um, you have um, the saying like, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I thought this was America, demonstrating um, privilege and, or overprivileged perspectives of um, being entitled and um, based on a, a certain maybe uh, socioeconomic and racial situation. Um, and those both are opposite views of America, but they are both looking at the concept of America. So in anthropology, we try to understand not only why in certain cultures develop um, what distinct patterns, but um, the beliefs behind them and the influences um, that cause those beliefs and, and behavior patterns to emerge. Um, I think looking at the concept of culture uh, is very difficult if you don't understand your own perspectives. And so what I like to do is look at the concept of uh, ethnocentrism and bias. So uh, ethnocentrism, it uh, has negative connotations, okay? Um, if you break the word down, ethno, like culture, and center, like, you know, centrism is center. Uh, and if somebody tells you to stop being ethnocentric, it, it usually means that you're judging um, somebody else in a negative way. Um, it, you know, in reality, we all judge others according to our ethnocenter. So you're, you're constantly operating um, within the world by trying to decode what's happening. But you do that from your own cultural perspective. And so, you know, essentially we're all ethnocentric, okay, which produces biases or preferences. Um, it's just realizing that you're judging or placing um, value on others according to yours as being superior, your own background as being superior. That, that's when it's negative, okay? Recognizing that you're doing that is, is a positive thing. Um, so one of the activities I like to go through uh, involves these, these three individuals, which come from different parts of the world, different cultures, um, and they all share uh, one thing in common, okay? They all have facial tattoos. Um, now, when you look at these individuals, uh, I don't know where, you know, you are from specifically, but, but most folks 
would uh, it immediately be able to identify the individual on, on the right, right? The, the, the blonde guy with the, the swastikas and skinhead. And um, there are a lot of symbols that you recognize because they are based on your experience within your culture, right? You, uh, United States society. Um, and, you know, obviously skinhead and swastikas are um, a white supremacist um, the, you know, way of communicating superiority, racial superiority, and um, the, the certain distinct perspectives negatively towards uh, others like minorities. And so we, we would deem that as being, uh, most people would say that, uh, that they don't agree with that individual's philosophy. Now, we don't know, right? But it also looks like he might be incarcerated, right? Um, the color of the, the clothing, the background with the stripes. Um, now, we don't, we don't know for sure. That's just a picture. But our experiences lend us to decode it in that way because that individual is part of the broader you know, U.S. society and, and American culture, even though you might not align with it. Um, the individuals on the other side um, appear to be from other places. Okay, so the uh, individual on the top left um, is actually uh, Maori, and he is from New Zealand. Uh, and traditional Maori uh, culture has, you know, emphasized facial tattoos for um, warriors who were you know, defending their communities, but um, we don't know what those symbols mean. I mean, the individual is also smiling, which is, you know, relaxing and offsetting, which we don't see it as negative, but it just seems um, that it's tribal or exotic. You know, we don't, we don't really know. Um, those symbols could be very similar to the ones um, that you see on the right. We, we don't know because he's not from our culture. Um, the woman on the bottom left uh, she also has facial tattoos. She's um, Burmese, and tr in traditional Burmese culture, um, there used to be a lot of kidnappings, uh, maraudering uh, from surrounding villages where uh, men would come and kidnap young girls and take them as you know slaves or wives or concubines or whatever. And so families started to tattoo the faces of their of the young girls so that they wouldn't be kidnapped and taken for slaves or, or whatever. Um, and so older women who had the facial tattoos um, were seen in uh, with respect, uh, with, uh, in a sense of purity, like that was a sign that they hadn't been put through that process. Uh, now, I, I have this picture because one of my students was Burmese and, and she told me about it and actually sent me that, that picture. Um, and she said that uh, that practice has been outlawed um, and so it's not common anymore, but traditionally it, uh, it, it was and it had its, its roots in um, preserving um, family and, and connection. So like you see, there are three different perspectives here of facial tattoos. Um, and our um, biases are, are, are interesting here because the one we know the most about is usually the one that people disagree with. Um, the other two we're more open to because we don't know um, about them. But nonetheless, it still shows you that you have a specific orientation towards symbols uh, that are more familiar with your culture. Um, now, I like to look at perspectives um, and ethnocentric um, views in terms of um, a, a continuum, right? So in, on this slide, you have four different modes of transportation. And if, uh, you know, if I were to ask you to arrange them from the most normal to the one that stands out the most to you, uh, you could say the strangest, um, you know, pretending that you walked out and saw these parked in front of your house or wherever you live. Um, most people would say that D on the bottom right, it would be the least eye-catching, right? Would be the most normal. Um, then probably B, even though it's a sports car and it's fancy, 
um, it would catch your eye, but it's still, you know, uh, you know, uh, somewhat normal to you. Um, and then the last two, right? So the one that's probably the, that would stand out the most or be the strangest to you would be C on the bottom left, um, because you don't normally see, uh, you know, a car without a top, um, or windshield, but it's covered in fur. Um, the steering wheel's on, on the opposite side that it, it normally is for us. Um, so that really stands out to you. Anyways, when you look at these pictures, um, you're, the cognitively, you, you arrange these in terms of um, the, the perception of being normal, okay? The ones that are the least normal or the strangest to you stand out the most. Now in anthropology, we call that markedness. So something that is marked really stands out to you. That means that it's farther away from your cultural core. Okay, it's farther away from your cultural norms. Things that seem normal are unmarked. And those are things that are part or closer to your cultural core. But it, it, it goes, uh, it's, it's in terms of a continuum. So when you think of, if we look at, keep with this concept of centrism, right? Um, things that are unmarked are part of your culture, and those are in those would be in the center of this particular graphic. Um, as things become um, more and more marked, they are farther and farther away from your cultural background, and that's why they're marked. So what we try to do is is avoid saying um, things like strange or weird, uh, and and acknowledge that something that is strange and weird to us is normal to somebody else, right? And that's why we use the terms marked and unmarked, right? So things that are unmarked to us are part of our cultural background. Um, as they become more and more marked, they are farther away from our background. But things that are marked to us are unmarked to other folks, okay? And that helps uh, level those, um, those judgments that, that we make on other folks and other uh, from different backgrounds, um, and you know we could do the same uh, activity multiple times here with with different perspectives of, for example, this this is transportation also, um, and if you talk about markedness, usually the most even though all of these are distinct and a little bit marked, um, the most unmarked if you saw these individuals out of in front of your house or a park would probably be C, even though that's not a traditional bicycle that you would see here. Um, then even though uh, A is something that you, you may never have seen, um, it's still a bicycle. Um, it's actually very creative for shopping purposes, I guess, for <laughs> transporting your groceries. But that would probably be the next on your um, continuum here. Then if you look at uh, B and D, uh, it just depends. So for me, camels would be the most marked mode of transportation of all of these. Um, and in D, you see horses. Well, horses, we have horses, you know, especially in the Tri-Cities. That's actually on Road 68 in Pasco, Road 68 in Sandifer. Um, I took that picture out my window because it, it was marked, more marked than those other bicycles would be for me. But, you know, I've had students who actually one of my students, th those were her neighbors. So for some, you know, some of you, the horses might be the most unmarked. Um, anyway, yeah, and my student told me that they, it's common for them to go and they would go through the drive through at, uh, at McDonald's on their horses. So, um, okay, the next one, we uh, are going to look at markedness in terms of you know, the way people dress. So just imagine going into class and seeing these individuals sitting next to you, you know, think about which ones would be the most, uh, which clothing would be the most unmarked versus most marked. Um, and so the, the young ladies in the upper right would probably be the most unmarked to you. Uh, they, you know, wearing the sweatshirts and, and, and pants. Then the, the next three are, are all distinct, but C would probably come next. Um, even though, yeah, you know, that's an ad from uh, J.C. Penney's catalog, I think, in the, from the 70s. Um, but the bright, bright colors and, you know, longer uh, 
shirt with no pants, you know, th those would definitely stand out as, as marked, but not as much as probably the, the other two. I, I'm guessing that A would probably be the most marked. Uh, you don't commonly see uh, you know, hunters from Papua New Guinea just wearing a cord <laughs> and, and, a, and holding spears and, and headdresses like that. Uh, and um, uh, that would be the most marked. But interestingly, D, when I, when I first started doing this slide, gosh, around 2002, D was commonly picked out as the most marked, being the women in the full um, head cover, full cover burqa, um, because around that time is when there was a, the, the broader sociopolitical um, perspectives of fundamental um, is Islamic terrorism and, and, and those notions that were uh, pretty common. That made people associate those particular ways of dressing as in terms of terrorism. And so it's just interesting that during that time period, that was the most marked, not because of the clothing, but the broader um, political environment that, that we were in. Okay. So when the, the next step in terms of understanding why things are marked or unmarked is understanding perspectives. Um, and in anthropology, we, we look at um, insider and outsider perspectives, especially for um, cultural anthropologists who go into communities and try to understand communities in the, from their own uh, perspective. Um, and so if you have an emic perspective, you have an insider view. That means you're probably part of that community, which means that the behaviors and the the patterns of interaction that you, you're seeing or involved in are all unmarked. Now, if you are not part of a community, um, you have an edit perspective, which is an, you're an outsider. That means that when you go in to uh, a, diff, a particular cultural group, um, everything's marked to you, okay? And uh, the, the, the everyday interactions that most people wouldn't even notice would stand out to you. Um, so for anthropologists, we want to be able to approximate to the greatest extent possible an insider perspective. You want to learn, you know, the language and experiences and understand what it's like to be from um, that particular group in order to be able to represent you know, their perspectives. Um, but if you're entirely an insider, it's really hard to notice marked features or, or nuanced interactions. So it, it can help to have an edit perspective, um, at least to some degree. And you know, for most of us, we have a balance. You know? So the research I do with uh, immigrant communities and educational contexts, um, I have a, a little bit of you know, both. Like I'm, I'm an insider in terms of a teacher and um, you know, with the educational system um, but I'm, I'm very much an outsider in terms of what it means to be an immigrant um, or a refugee. Um, so with Spanish speaking communities, you know, I speak Spanish. So that, that helps me, uh, you know, gauge an understanding and be able to communicate with, with folks who speak Spanish. Uh, but with other communities that, that I don't, you know, speak the language with, it, it can be more difficult. So um, it helps to have a balance of, of both. Um, now, just to practice your own emic and edic perspectives, um, I have a, a couple pictures here. So if I asked you to tell me what you see uh, here, you know, you could look at it for a few seconds and uh, most people would, would start saying, okay, it's Halloween. Um, there's like the pumpkins and costumes you see, Spider-Man, and Disney characters or whatever. Um, it's probably at a school. Um, it's some sort of carnival or, or fair or something. And all of that is just, I mean, this took place, I took this picture in Arizona. And so e even though it's very far away, there are certain things that are uh, familiar to us from our own cultural scripts that help us decode what's happening in this situation. Um, if any of those uh, concepts came or clear to you, that means you have an emic perspective 
of this particular context, um, even though you're not from, might be from this, this group in, in Arizona. Um, now, if I, sh when I show this picture, uh, it, it w which is, it's a lot of fun to, to look at. Um, I actually took the photograph myself. Uh, a lot of people will be able to at least decode that it's a, some sort of wrestling event Okay, um, it's not showing, uh, you know, a, a battle within a war context or something like that. I mean, even though there's some grimacing and it looks like there's some painful stuff going on. Um, and so most people will get that, right? It's, it's some sort of wrestling. Um, and then you see some familiar symbols like Batman. Now, if you are more familiar with um, Mexican culture, you might even be able to pinpoint things like uh, okay, this is, it's called Lucha Libre. It's a part, it's a type of Mexican wrestling. And then if you're familiar with the movie Nacho Libre, the, the individual with the blue mask, blue and red mask, that's supposed to be Nacho Libre. So there are varying degrees of insider, um, you know, knowledge of what's going on here. Um, and the last one uh, is for m the most, the most folks, I, I've had one person in 15 years um, who's under understood what was happening or, or been familiar with this group. Um, but most people would look at this picture and um, guess that it is some sort of competition or um, you know a wrestling match or something like that. And a lot of that comes from the so the picture in the upper left is a top view of what's happening, you know, and on the right, that's inside the structure. And then the bottom left is just focused in on a couple individuals. But that shape of the, the structure is representative of, you know, like a stadium or something that's from our background. So you, you automatically start making assumptions about, you know, what's happening based on your own experiences. And that, that's natural versus when you don't know anything about what's happening just trying to be objective and describe you know, that you see individuals sitting around, that they appear to be um, male, you know, the guys on the bottom left are holding a pole, and one guy seems to be blowing into another guy's face. There's another guy with feathers on his arm, right? Um, in reality, it's just, it's, it's a group from uh, northeastern Brazil called the Yanomamo, and the guys are relaxing and using some, in, they're ingesting some tobacco, it's hallucinogenic tobacco, and um, you know, there's no competition. That, that structure is around house where they, they live. Um, and so the idea here is to show something that's very different and marked so that y you can see how your perceptions of y your own familiar background being like competitions or whatever, start causing you to decode and, and make assumptions about what's happening. Um, now, the, the opposite of ethnocentrism is cultural relativism. So cultural relativism is the concept of trying to understand uh, a culture and the culture's acts and behaviors and, and ideas and values you know, from their own perspective. And understanding that that all cultural features are they're relative, they're they're equally complex and sophisticated from their own terms. Okay, so understanding the culture and uh, from its own terms. Um, and here you see, you know, guys, the Yanomamo guys uh, using tobacco on the right, and on the left, it's a middle school kid shoving hot Cheetos up his nose. So you know. To us, you would see that and laugh and go, oh, yeah, well, middle school kids are pretty funny. And that seemed like something that they would do, right? Um, on the right, you've never seen it. And so you have to step back before judging and say, oh, that's, that's bad. Or why are they doing it? And say, hey, that's just you know, a way that they, uh, you know, that they behave and, and interact. OK, so we've looked at culture from uh, quite a few different angles here. Uh, and now I want to talk about how, how you learn that, how, you, how do you learn those behaviors and, and acquire those 
uh, ideas and values. So looking at cultural transmission, uh, we can talk about three different processes. Uh, so the first one, enculturation, so think N, like uh, within. Enculturation is the process of learning your first culture. That's what C1 means. Uh, and so you learn your, your culture just like you, you acquire it, right? Like you acquire a language by interacting with whatever group you are raised in. So it doesn't matter what you look like phenotypically, the color of your skin, your hair, your eyes, whatever, that you will culturally, um, you will acquire the culture of whatever group you're raised in. Okay, and that's called enculturation. Acculturation, think um, the prefix uh, like going towards. So acculturation is the process um, through which you have already acquired a first culture. And at some point you either change cultural contexts or another one is imposed on you. <laughs> but most of the time it's easy to see this with uh, immigrants who go to, who move to different cultural contexts. And acculturation means you are going through the process of learning a new culture. Um, and that's what the C2 means. So it's the process of learning a, a, a second or additional culture. Um, now that, that process is, is very common. Um, and you know, for me, I, I work with teachers and um, I work with them on understanding that their students who come from immigrant backgrounds and, and immigrant family backgrounds you know, they're going through this process and so it's their job to help students um, you know maintain their their first culture and um, you know, facilitate the process of learning that new cultures to to acclimate up, um, into the newer context so acculturation then over it, it, it depends, but usually over generations will result in somebody being um, like bicultural. Uh, many of you probably feel culturally fluent and, and at ease in um, different cultures, right? Uh, maybe your family comes from, you know, uh, Latin America or, um, you know, I've had a lot of Russian or Ukrainian students and uh, you feel comfortable in, in both. Um, and that's a beautiful thing. That's called biculturalism. Um, a acculturation, you know, can also uh, develop into assimilation. So over generations, depending on, you know, choice of like partners and, and how, you know, kids are raised and whatever, um, individuals will assimilate into the broader cultural context. So um, I recently found out that I had family from France who came uh, over in the 1600s through Canada and then Montana and and whatever. I, I have no connection at all to France. And so my family was assimilated over um, multiple generations. So um, again, acculturation is the process of learning an additional culture. Uh, and, uh, you know, that can result in assimilation or bi or multiculturalism. And, you know, it's it, it, the, the more successful folks are at uh, acculturating and maintaining their own culture. Um, really depends on a variety of factors, right? So the, the last concept is deculturation, and that's a negative concept, that uh, D, like removing. Uh, deculturation involves the intentional removal of a culture or um, cultural features. So this is very evident in the way that Native Americans were um, and have been you know, treated throughout the history of um, colonialism and um, you know current political situations over the past couple hundred years uh, but you see even after you know hundreds of years of, of you know genocide and, and annihilation and, and murder and the horrible things that that the government imposed on Native Americans you know in that like the 1860s they uh, the mantra was, kill the Indian and save the man. And so they started doing things like boarding schools where they would take kids from you know, their, their homes and put them into these schools and inflict corporal punishment on them if they spoke their language or um, you know, acted in ways that seemed um, too Indian. And that, you know, that um, we've seen other campaigns of genocide too. Um, 
throughout history that are, that are horrible. So, uh, you know, m killing folks is, is a, the ultimate form of deculturation, like removing a culture by its group. And, you know, recently with Rwanda, and we've seen this in Sudan, you know, Nazi Germany and um, the Holocaust, things like that. Um, but it also happens in subtle ways. So in Arizona, while I lived there, the, um, there was a law passed that made bilingual education um, illegal. So they focused on language as a way to um, remove kids from their culture, right? not physically, but psychologically right? and linguistically. So they made teaching in any language other than English um, illegal unless you were teaching like Spanish to English speakers. Um, and you, you couldn't help kids with, uh, you know, with their own language in a way that they could understand. So that's a, that's a, a direct, though subtle form of trying to remove specific cultural features. Anyway, it's like what I emphasize with, with my teachers is to not be complicit in processes of deculturation. So if there's a, um, a policy or some sort of um, activity that is framing specific cultures in a negative way that, uh, you know, they, that needs to be recognized and addressed so they, that um, kids and families aren't made to feel inferior about their cultural background. So the next um, set of concepts uh, is born out of right, culture and uh, multiculturalism and looks at notions of race and ethnicity, um, which are also very complex and sophisticated concepts to try to flesh out. So uh, the first thing that I, I like to do is ask people, like, what is race, right? So, um, and how the book talks about it is similar to culture. Like it, it talks about it in various different ways. Um, race is something that uh, it was born out of uh, colonialism and it was uh, a way to basically justify superiority of the colonizers, okay? And so it's a concept that was used as a political tool to categorize individuals according to their um, social worth. Okay, and the picture I have up here is of, it's, a, it's from colonial Mexico, and this was the hierarchy, the racial hierarchy that determined um, individuals' potential access to power, to um, socioeconomic um, opportunities, and land ownership, and, and, uh, and so forth. So the very top left would be the, the superior race um, and that was individuals who were born in Spain. So if you were born in Spain and uh, then you came to uh, the to Mexico, then you were seen and this is in co the colonial area, you were seen as superior, right? So you had um, political power, you had wealth, you, you were seen as automatically being um, act, granted access to a variety of different resources. Um, next would be on the list, to the, just to the right would be like, um, if your parents were born in Spain and moved to what is now Mexico, and then uh, the child from those individuals uh, would, would be next on the list, right? So, um, and, and so on and so forth. Then you have, like if your grandparents are born in Spain and or one person was born in Spain, one was born in Mexico, and until so you get into mixing with um, like uh, someone who maybe has a child with uh, an African slave or a slave of African descent or of Indian descent, or um, all the way down those different combinations down to the very bottom of the social um, hierarchy would have been the indigenous communities, right? Um, and so while this example highlights just what was was going on in, in Mexico. This was very common throughout the colonial era. Um, and there are a lot of really good 
videos on you know the process of defining race and and how it was used to justify European superiority and um, how it then was uh, you know proven scientifically, which was false. But they tried to use science as a way to say that you know there are different species of humans and you know um, who is superior over the others. And, um, but what what this did was really develop an ingrained hierarchy within societies that has had unfolding effects over the past 500 years um, that we still see today. Um, and so it's interesting, I mean, now we're in a census year, so it's interesting to look at different definitions of race and, and how even when you try to define it, it, it still doesn't make sense. Um, so speaking of the census, this is from the government census page. Um, and if you look in the middle part of that, you can see it says the racial categories included in the census questionnaire generally reflect a social definition of race recognized in this country and not an attempt to define race biologically, anthropologically, or genetically. In addition, it is recognized that the categories of the race item include racial and national origin or sociocultural groups. People may choose to report more than one race to indicate their racial mixture, such as American Indian and white. People who identify their origin as Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish may be of any race. What? So that's very confusing. Okay, so if you you read that and then you try to fill out the census questionnaire, you're still left wondering what you know what you should put. So the government provides definitions of what these um, categories mean, and so. Uh, you, you can go through and say, okay, well, a white, somebody who's white is a person having origins in any of the original peoples of Europe, the Middle East, or North Africa. I mean, there are a lot of tan folks in the Middle East and North Africa, but they're still considered white. Um, Asian is another interesting one. So a person having origins in any of the original peoples of the Far East, Southeast Asia, or the Indian subcontinent, including, for example, Cambodia, China, India, Japan, Korea, Malaysia, Pakistan, Philippine Islands, Thailand, and Vietnam. What's interesting is the biggest country in Asia, not most populous, right? The biggest country in Asia isn't mentioned, right? Being Russia. And so it's really interesting when I um, ask students of mine who are from Russia if they consider themselves Asian, a lot of times they say no. And so that, even though Russia is in, is in Asia, um, so what that shows us is that these categories are culturally constructed to fit, you know, an understanding of, of groups. Um, but it's very messy and blurry. And, it, and when you, you keep digging into it, there's no specific you know, boundary of, of what these mean. We just know, but why is that? Um, these, so I have a couple examples of you know, these demographic questionnaires that, that we all fill out, whether it's at the DMV or whatever, applications to CDC or WSU or whatever um, school you go to. Uh, and one of my students sent me this, and this was on a state mandated test for teachers. Um, and so it says, what is your ethnicity, right? Hispanic Latino, not Hispanic Latino. Okay, so check that. What's your race, right? American Indian, Asian, Black, Native, or White. And my, the student who sent this was, she considered herself um, Latino, right? Uh, or Hispanic. And she, she was like, I didn't know what to put. I laugh. I was like, oh, okay, well, I guess you don't have a race, right? Just joking. Um, this is from our, like, WSU, uh, our application, and it's very similar. Are you his Hispanic or Latino, Latina, or Spanish origin? Yes, check all that apply. And they list a bunch of countries. Um, and then how do you describe your race? American Indian, Alaska Native, Asian, Black. Native Hawaiian, white, right? So what's interesting is that say you're, you know, you are Latino and then it's like, well, what's your race? Um, I know like my wife is from Brazil. And so when we had our, our daughter and we were in the hospital 
and um, you know, we had our real late, like midnight or one in the morning, and I went out to get some water after she was born, and I heard the the nurses arguing, you know, what is she? Is she Latina? No, she's from, the mom's from Brazil. Isn't that Latin America? No, it's not. She didn't speak Spanish. And there was this really interesting conversation about her identity. Um, and then the next day, you know, when you have a baby, they give you a bunch of paperwork to fill out um, that they submit. And one of them was with the social security office for a social security card. And it had the same information. And so it says, are you Hispanic or, uh, you know, what's your ethnicity? And then it had all these things in it. And then it said other. And so I wrote, um, Brazilian. And then on the, when it said, what is your race? It gave a bunch of categories like this and it said other, and I just circled other and drew an arrow to the, where I put Brazilian up above, because in my mind, I wanted the person who processes the paper to sit there and think like, oh, wow, what does that mean? Are we talking about a country and ethnicity and nationality? Uh, anyways. Um, so I, the, what I, what I like to do is ask, you know, folks how they identify and what does that mean? And, and it's, it always, or it usually ends up in the same way, right? It ends up with people describing their identity in terms of experiences versus a category. Uh, and the, the example I have here is from a student of mine. Um, and this was, a, I was teaching Chicano history and um, I had a question on here to see how the students would answer. And, um, this particular student, uh, she was Latina, and she gave a really cool uh, you know, answer for this question. Um, and so the question says, you know, what's the difference between Latino and, and Chicano, and uh, how do you identify yourself? And so she says, Latino is a person who comes to the U.S. from a Latin American country. A Chicano is a person who was born in the U.S. but has a Mexican parents. Other terms used are Hispanic or Mexican-American. American slash Mexican. I identify myself as Chicana because my parents are from Mexico and I'm from the U.S. Yet, I celebrate both cultures. I can't say I'm American because I'm not. My native language is Spanish. I don't have barbecues. I have carne asada. I also, if you asked anyone, they'd rapidly say I'm not white. I'm brown skinned with brown eyes. My Mexican culture is more in me than my American. When we get invited to a party, we don't go alone. We invite all our tios, like their aunts and uncles. Uh, when we eat at the party, we get seconds, thirds, and take some home. And the party doesn't end until your body drops. That's something I see in Mexico a lot. In parentheses, I've been there. And here too, when you attend any Mexican organized party. I don't think it's the same for Americans. I'm used to the music and the escándalo, like the scandal, <laughs> going on, and that's me. That's Mexico. At the same time, though, a little part of me will always uh, be American because I was born here. This is a beautiful example of how somebody rationalizes their ethnicity and identity. Right. So she started off with these academic descriptions um, and definitions, and then. Uh, even to the point where she says she's Chicana and she celebrates both cultures, but then she her narrative really unfolds into her experiences of identifying with um, Mexican communities and, and culture and music and, and the language and um, and that that's essentially the the way we want to look at someone's identity, right? Like you aren't a category; you are the accumulation of your experiences. Um, and this is a, uh, you know, a way for that you can see how, how somebody processes those. Um, you know, but there are other ways that racial terms are used um, in, in ways that uh, can be, you know, uh, beneficial or hurtful. Um, this particular slide comes from uh, a candidate for, um, that was running for Congress, I believe in Tennessee, and um, who identified with a white supremacist background and was um, using, was playing off of uh, the president's, President Trump's Make America Great Again, you know, with Make America White Again. And so here it shows that a racial category is used to leverage power and superiority and um, oppression, right? the notion of whiteness is also used in, in other ways too. So 
this the clip that I have here, we're not going to watch it, um, although I encourage you to, comes from the, there's a, a film that was put on by MTV uh, called uh, White People, uh, or hashtag white people. And it looks at the experiences of folks who come from uh, what's, what's deemed a white background and, and how, you know, their identities and experiences have um, in some ways privileged, you know, their, their current position in other ways. Um, They've developed certain perspectives towards others, but this is a, it's a really uh, cool way to look at the concept of whiteness, right? And I think when you start talking about racial categories, uh, you know, the, the reason why I enjoy teaching this class is, is so we can have that conversation that it's, it's not bad to be whatever category, right? And um, being from a white, background it doesn't mean that you're a bad person it means that it's good to look at historical trajectories and the way that you know your experiences m may have been um, you know facilitated based on racial you know uh, equities or inequities I should say uh, on a broader scale um, and so it, it, it it's fun to talk about you know why these things have emerge and not to be defensive, but to, you know, to look deeper at what, what whiteness means and, and on the other side of it, what, what it means to not come from a white background and, and what it means to be perceived in certain ways according to racial stereotypes. Um, and those are conversations that need to be had. I mean, um, people shy away from them and get defensive uh, or get aggressive instead of digging through, you know, how these things have emerged and uh, different patterns that, that we can identify, uh, you know, for social justice reasons um, to, to mitigate some of the, the marginalization that occurs for folks from uh, minority backgrounds. Um, so another way that it, it, I think it's beneficial to use categories is to look at how groups um, trend, broader social trends for specific groups. Um, and again, you know, I'm prefacing this by, I want to say that I understand that these categories, it's, it's messy and not clear and clean cut and, and well-defined, but on a, a bigger, per, um, you know, broader level, it, using these types of categories can help reveal distinct social inequities, you know. Um, and the way that I, I do this in my professional context is to look at education, right? So um, when you look at, say, dropout rates, um, it's very, um, you know, troublesome to look at, you know, the higher rates of, of educational challenges and difficulties that um, emerge for groups from minority backgrounds, especially uh, Latinos and African Americans and, and Native Americans. Uh, and when you look at educational attainment levels, you also see very stark differences. You know, folks from uh, white backgrounds have a higher, you know, rate of you know high school and uh, post-secondary educational attainment. Um, and then when you look at you know blacks and and Latinos and Native Americans, it's you know it, it's reason to be concerned. Like, what's going on? to produce these types of trends, right? What are we doing in schools and in the educational system that is um, not serving communities, uh, minority communities in a way to promote their you know, access to higher education? And that, that really lends itself to understanding um, you know, poverty rates. So when you look at educational attainment and dropout rates and, and you, you see, you know, Latinos and African Americans and, and Native Americans facing such challenges. It's the same thing in, uh, when you look at poverty rates. Okay. And so understanding poverty and economic, um, socioeconomic attainment is, is a powerful way to look at these other social inequities, you know, um, incarceration rates, and, uh, and pregnancy and, and, and substance abuse and things like that. Um,
but why is that? Okay, so looking at categories in that way helps us identify, look, that we need to change something. Something needs to be done differently um, to counter those trends. Uh, and one thing that, that I'm particularly interested in is the, the way that our education system produces not only college access, right, and, and college graduates, but then like teachers. So when you look at teachers across the United States, but let's just look at, at Washington right now, I mean, the majority of teachers come from a white background. Not only a white background, but a white English speaking background. And then um, a white English speaking background from middle or upper class. So you, teaching, um, even though teachers and their personalities may be different, in, or, you know, and, and, and very greatly, in general, they're a very homogenous group. Um, so in Washington, uh, you know, 90% of teachers come from a white background. Um, I have the Tri-Cities, you know, statistics listed here, and you can see Pasco has more than, than normal in terms of teachers from a diverse background. Um, and that's because of the, you know, we have a really good system of bilingual education here um, and Kennewick too, but you still see that like in Pasco, 75% of the students come from a non-white background. And so uh, you're looking at the majority of students come from a non-white background. Um, the free and reduced lunch rate is usually an index of poverty. So come from a low socioeconomic status uh, background, a non-white background, but yet the teachers who are you know, responsible for helping them in, uh, through the education system come from a different background than they do. This isn't to say white teachers are bad and, and I feel comfortable talking about these things because that's what I do for a living is you know, train teachers. But it, the fact is, we need to do a better job of working with teachers on understanding culturally diverse students and linguistically diverse students. We also need to do a better job um, producing results and helping students, you know, achieve academic um, success so that they can go into higher education and eventually become teachers you know, that can come back and identify with students from a similar background, you know, be role models, understand the cultural nuances and, and have more of that um, emic perspective of what their students are experiencing, um, which will then promote, you know, more educational opportunities and hopefully higher access, um, you know, on a larger scale. Uh, I have similar statistics here for other locations, other districts around Eastern Washington, since a lot of a lot of you are probably from that line districts too, but it's a, it's the same same patterns, you know. Um, I mean, look at Waluk, the Waluk School District in Mattawa. Eighty nine percent of the teachers come from a white English speaking background, and ninety six percent, almost all the students come from a minority background. And so, when you think about what are those students seeing on an everyday basis, right? and then on the other side, the teachers even though I believe that you know, the majority of teachers have um, you know, really uh, positive and, and good intentions, you know, not understanding the students can cause difficulties, right? In engaging them and, and helping them learn. So, uh, and actually, I, well, Luke is, I just pointed out because of the statistics, but they've been involved with the, you know, some really uh, innovative approaches to working with with diverse students and families, like out doing wide, widespread um, home visits and, and a lot of really proactive things because they recognize the need to, to help teachers identify with students and families and, um, and their background. So that's, uh, that's something really, really positive that, that I want to congratulate the Waluk School District on. Okay, so the, this, the point of today's discussion wa wasn't to give you definitions and to point out facts so much as it was to show you how difficult and complex, you know, concepts like culture and race and ethnicity are, especially when you look at how they play out on the ground, on, on the everyday. Um, so I hope that that will give you a better understanding um, 
um, you know, how we're trying to approach these concepts, but even more so, I, I hope that, you know, it'll give you an understanding of, you know, looking at yourself and your own identity and your own cultural preferences as a way to understand others, right? And to say that others do things differently because they come from a different background. Um, and that you, the things that you do and the way that you interact um, is because of your background. It's not superior, it's just, you know, it's different, right? Um, okay.